So if you're driving across the uh, Geneva to France border, um, you may notice this sort of plum pudding um, here. This is one of the CERN conference centers that's, uh, that's available. But nestling behind it, which is less well visible, is one of the CERN experiment surface buildings. That's the Atlas experiment. So um, my job uh, is to look after the compute and monitoring at the CERN data center. Um, the view from just outside my office is, is a rather intriguing one, which is uh, the antimatter factory is just <laughs> along the road. Um, it's really uh, not like Dan Brown described in Angels and Demons, <laughs> if anyone has read it. Um, previously, I'd worked for IBM here in the UK, in, in Winchester, um, and then after that, uh, moved out to Deutsche Bank in, in Switzerland, where I looked after the private banking infrastructure in Europe. So CERN's mission, it's a little bit blah, blah, I'll read you through things. It, it's more than just the physics. The, the, the physics is part of it, uh, pushing back the frontiers of knowledge. But at the same time, we want to be developing technologies using that goal to then enhance underlying solutions and then be able to bring that back to the rest of the world. It is also, though, to make sure that the members of the public, that we are producing high quality scientists for the future. And this involves naturally confronting difficult physics <coughs> problems, but also setting up a framework under which people can come to CERN for a short period of time, become well-trained, and then return to their member state countries uh, after that. So it's very much a question of focusing on education. And then it's a multicultural environment. Um, there are over 100 different countries, uh, nationalities working at CERN. And this is a way of focusing on science as a common theme around which many different nationalities can work together to solve a difficult problem. CERN itself uh, was founded in 1954 um, as a place where scientists could work together in for, for peace. Um, the budget is around a billion dollars a year. Um, that's coming from the different member states, um, and there's a list there. Now, a majority of them are part of the European Union, and we'll save the question for uh, the question <laughs> and answer session. <laughs> um, however, it's not a complete overlap. So Ireland is not a CERN member. Um, Israel is. Um, so because the organization was formed before the European Union, then it means that it's structured independently of that as an international uh, organization. Um, so for the budget of a, of a billion dollars, um, that corresponds to roughly a cappuccino for each person in the member states. So it's a reasonable amount to be giving uh, to get the World Wide Web and understanding the nature of the universe. Um, that having been said, um, there are a large number of nationalities. The UK contribution is down here. So there are 240 people from CERN, uh, <coughs> working at CERN, who are UK nationals. Um, and a set of younger people, fellows, doctoral students, and, and technical students that are then uh, collaborating. However, it's a worldwide facility. Uh, there are member states that fund the laboratory, but this is being used by everyone across the world. So the actual facility itself, so I'd mentioned the antimatter uh, factory, which is there. Um, and it's actually derived from a set of accelerators that were built from the 1960s onwards. So the earliest ones, the PS, the proton synchrotron, was the first one built. Then the second one was the SPS. And then the larger tunnel, which is used now by the Large Hadron Collider and was previously used by the LEP uh, colliders. So <coughs> what happens is that from a small bottle of hydrogen down here, we strip the electrons off and then take the protons, the hydrogen nuclei, and then accelerate them out. And this is what's nice about having rings, which is you can gradually speed them up. And then eventually those get sent round and finally sent around where they collide at the four experiment sites. If you get a chance to go underground, and CERN now has finished its run of the accelerator, so people are now going underground to do maintenance work. Um, so you can actually go underground um, there are even possibilities for visitors to go along, book places, um, and have a chance to go and see the, the accelerator. Um, 
So what you would see is you'd see these long blue, blue, blue tubes. There's 1,200 superconducting magnets, um, and these <coughs> are cooled down to about minus 271 degrees centigrade, uh, and that allows them to bend the beams of protons around. Inside, there are two small tubes, like uh, one centimeter across, and this is where the actual beams go, um, and those are evacuated to levels below the pressure on the moon. At four places, there are these cathedral-like structures. This is about the height of uh, St. Paul's um, in terms of its size. It weighs about 7,000 uh, tons. And as you can see from the person here, these are large. Um, it, they can be viewed as digital cameras. Um, so they're like 100 <coughs> megapixel cameras, but they take 40 million pictures a second. Um, and that's what produces the one petabyte. So it, it's faster than your average uh, Instamatic. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so the LHC itself, as Gav mentioned, was based off a set of work that went on in the 19, uh, so from theories in the 1960s. Professor Higgs from Edinburgh uh, was one of the proponents of that. Um, and then in the 1980s, people started to think, could we actually build <coughs> something that would allow us to discover the Higgs boson? Now, in the 1980s, building a machine of this size would not have been feasible. The technologies were missing. Um, but a set of people said, well, how big do we need to build it? And well, let's imagine that someone invents superconductivity and uh, we can have superconducting magnets, then wouldn't it be great? And this is the kind of timescales that now large science is having to look at. We're looking at multi-decades, theories, planning, and then eventually realization. And one of the things that Professor Higgs said that was uh, during a very emotional uh, speech as he discovered this particle that he'd been waiting for for 50 years um, was that he hadn't imagined that this was something that experimental physics could prove in his lifetime. <coughs> but CERN offshoots are, are more than that. Um, it, two days ago, we just had the, uh, the event at CERN, the, the 30th anniversary of the paper on the World Wide Web. Um, so Tim Berners-Lee, again, a, another Brit, um, produced an idea um, and wrote up a paper. Um, his supervisor wrote vague but interesting <laughs> on the, uh, the outside. Um, that is the web. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and th there's a very interesting set of videos where uh, they explain some of the, uh, the thoughts behind it and how things evolved, and equally, some of the dangers of what's come along. Um, this was the first World Wide Web server. Initially, there was one. It sat in Tim's office, <coughs> plugged into the network. But because there weren't many power sockets in the office, then when the office came to be cleaned, the cleaner would come in and unplug this funny black box and then uh, plug in the, the, the cleaning machines, clean it up, and then plug it back in again. So he had to stick a sign on it that says, this is a server. Do not unplug. Because the, the internet generally would go down if this guy was, uh, was unplugged. Um, but already from that, the ideas grew. And in particular, uh, a couple of years after the first thing was done, we started with some graphics. And uh, this is a, a pop group. It's a thing called the Les Horribles Sonnet, LHC. Um, and they sing a set of unique physics love songs, um, <laughs> which, if you go onto YouTube, there are some, some classics. Um, one thing that, about this that was clear, though, was that at the time there were multiple other solutions, um, Archie, Gopher. Um, but because CERN, in its nature, wanted to give things back, the uh, approach was very much one of saying, this invention has been done, now put it into the public domain. And that was the basis, I think, under which the World Wide Web became the dominant technology, because it was something people could build on. There are other offshoots that come along. Um, and for example, hadron therapy, which allows you to use um, targeted beams of protons to address cancer. It's a lot more effective uh, than x-rays. Um, equally, imaging the MRI machines, scanners, use similar magnet technologies. Um, other spin things like capacitive touch screens, the basis for uh, many of the initial mobile phones. Um, so when we show the kids around the, uh, the, the CERN site and we explain, imagine your life if you had no World Wide Web and no smartphones, um, then you can tribute both of those back to CERN. <coughs> so how do we process the data? It's a long chain. Um, so the detectors themselves produce streams. 
that then have to be filtered down to get them down to reasonable levels. A petabyte a second we can't afford to record, even if technologically we could find ways to, uh, to do it. And this is then stored eventually in the data centers on tape. Um, <coughs> we use tape widely. Uh, it's a very cost-effective medium. Um, a little bit slow at times to get the first byte, but actually once it gets going, it's really very fast. Um, at the same time, we're doing simulations, and simulations allow you to say, if the theory is correct, what should the world look like? And then we match those two together, and then based off that, we're able to make the appropriate discoveries. And that's the chunk of work that goes on in the CERN data center. CERN itself is at the center of a grid. Um, this is a multi-site computing farm. Um, it's 170 uh, sites around the world uh, collaborating now as part of this. And with those, we arrange that we keep a copy of the data and that 11, 12 big other sites keep a copy of the data too. That means in the event of anything going wrong, we'll be able to get that data back again. And then universities contribute as they can their computing capacity. And we then hook this all together into a single computing unit for the physics. So what we do see is that with the data rates that we're seeing, varying rates, in particular one of the experiments um, for a month every year, we choose to collide lead ions rather than protons. So this is 200 protons and neutrons together. Um, and that then allows us to create conditions just after the Big Bang to simulate quark gluon plasma. Um, and those data rates then become significant compared to the data rates when we're just colliding uh, hydrogen. We have two data centers, uh, one in Geneva and one in Budapest. Uh, and we link those together then with the outside world um, to allow the other universities to participate in analyzing this data. Um, so 2018 um, was the last year of the run, the run two. Uh, we had a first run earlier on, now we are into the run two. Um, and the sort of volumes that we're seeing, especially here during these heavy iron runs, just drive this uh, exponential growth. Um, so here we're seeing 330 petabytes in total stored. Um, around 100 of that has come from the 2018 run on its own. At the same time, the computing capacities needed are going up significantly. So we're currently processing around 400,000 concurrent jobs around the grid at the same time. And again, very similar curves that we have to be able to maintain and continue. And all of this is being done on a constant budget, which is one of the challenges of the, of the organization. It's very important that we don't have the physics being limited by the computing. And then I think the most <laughs> difficult diagram is, this is the network diagram. Um, <laughs> I have great respect for the people that are managing the, the routing tables for, for all of this. Um, by its nature, we're connecting together a huge number of sites we use the academic networks, the Géant network, uh, very intensively. And this means that those interconnections between the universities, while CERN uses them, are also then available for, for other universities to use as well. So at the moment, we are currently just come to the end of run two. We have a long shutdown two here. And previously, we had a long <coughs> shutdown one. What happens is that we run the accelerator, we try and keep things running fairly smoothly, <coughs> and then after that, you have a period of something like 18 months or two years when you can let the accelerator cool down so you're such that you can get in there. <coughs> you can repair anything that needs repairing, you can do upgrades. Um, and then at that point, at the end of that long shutdown, you shut everything up again, you cool the ring down, and then you start the next run. And this leads to a certain rhythm in terms of how we, we work. There is a period of stability and a period of significant change during the shutdown. So ironically, we're often busier during the shutdown periods because we're making the changes compared to during the runs where we're trying to keep things going to maximize the use of the, the accelerator. What were the red dots in those um, So the... <coughs> oh, big luminosity. Red, right. So what currently what the aim is is that as part of the... The, the beams, they don't just send around one proton in one direction and one in the other direction and hope that you can line them up. They're, they're pretty small. Um, so what they do instead is they send around bunches. Um, and with those bunches, then you hope you get a certain number of collisions. 
And gradually what they're doing is to increase the number of protons in each of the bunches, which then increases the chances of collisions. Um, so that suggests then for the high luminosity, we're just concentrating those bunches so more of the bunches get used. Correct, yes. So basically you make sure you get more collisions within a certain time slice. Um, that creates a set of computing problems that I'll come on to in a moment. So from a, a computing point of view, we follow the same cadence. So we, we started off in the 60s and 70s with mainframes, and then after that, we had a variety of uh, Unix workstations. Um, we even tried some Windows compute uh, facilities at one point. Um, and then eventually, with the Linux growth, we were able to actually standardize on a single architecture, which has been a huge benefit. And it's followed a very nice growth curve. As with Moore's law, we see things growing in the past at a, at a nice rate. We were able to standardize on Linux. And then with that, consolidate the computing facilities into a single facility rather than dedicated environments for each experiment. However, at the time, uh, to manage farms of 1,000 machines was something that peop other people didn't do. We're still very early on in the web days. Um, so we had some European Union funding <coughs> to develop some tools. Um, and in particular, tools like Quator for configuration management and Lemon were developed. They are open source tools, but the difficulty is that they didn't build a community behind them. Um, and that's one of the key aspects that, that we find. It's one thing to do some initiative at CERN and give it out to the world, but you need to build the community. Um, and that meant that we took a slightly different approach when we came to doing the long shutdown too. Rather than us inventing tools, we adopted tools from elsewhere and then we enhanced them to make them better for the CERN use cases. And there we use tools like OpenStack for the cloud, Puppet for configuration management, and Grafana for the displays. Um, going forward, now we're starting to face long shutdown too. We're now seeing the growth of Kubernetes and Helm as the underlying tool set. Much of these transitions are driven also by the fact that many CERN staff will be doing shorter contracts at CERN. So they're coming out of the universities with a skill set. And if we tell them, for example, please maintain Quator, you need to know Perl, um, it's not very attractive to come to CERN to use Perl. Whereas if what you do is you say, oh, you can do Go and containers and uh, this kind of thing, then it's a lot easier to justify. So the sort of sky, size of uh, what we're doing, this is the, the CERN OpenStack Cloud. So it's around 300,000 cores um, in terms of the, the total pool spread across these two data centers. Um, but already we're seeing a significant growth in this area of Magnum clusters. Those are Kubernetes clusters that the users are spinning up in a self-service way. So we've already got over 500 Kubernetes clusters being used by the experiments. It's a fairly busy cloud. There's, there's lots of new virtual machines being created, some work being done, but there's also long-term uh, machines that are run. Uh, the pension fund, the holiday uh, reservation databases, they all go onto this uh, facility. So it's about 90% of the total capacity that uh, is allocated out uh, come from this cloud. So what we learned from this, um, we found that the interaction between an organization like CERN and open source is a very natural fit. Uh, we're multicultural, um, we're used to sharing. Um, and that's worked very well in terms of a way under which CERN developments can be given back to society and benefit others. <coughs> Equally, with the contract rotation, it, it's a very good match to allow people to come along and then leave with something good on their CVs. Um, so they're leaving with something that it is an attractive thing, and equally it inspires them to, to work. Um, but equally, we need to invest in building up the open source communities, making sure that they can remain sustainable. And this means helping out on things like governance, so a number of members serve on boards of open source foundations, um, and also making sure that we can evangelize and allow people to use the CERN name to then build up communities. So we organize a lot of dojos at CERN where communities meet there. We use the CERN conference facilities to then provide them with an environment under which they can share things, but also it's an attractive place to come along and have a look around. So now we basically moved over from a set of proprietary open source developed tools at CERN into a set of public general tools that everyone can download and use. While we've been doing that, we've also been driving openness elsewhere. Um, in the past, what used to happen is that when you did a scientific paper, um, 
you would write up the paper and you would then submit it to a journal who would then arrange to review it. And then the journal's business model was to sell you a copy of the proceedings of that conference. So you end up in a situation where you were writing the paper and then you were paying to receive a copy of the paper that you'd written. Um, now the approach is to go towards open publishing. Uh, now what this means is that instead organizations like CERN fund the process to review, but everyone, whether you're buying or whether you're contributing to the experiment or not, should have access to that data. And that means that then science is available to all to read, and in particular it inspires a set of citizen scientists who get increasingly interested in what's going on and some of the leading edge. The other aspect is around open data. Um, so there's actually a set of curated data sets from CERN that are available through a portal. You can come along and actually be a physicist for a day, um, run through some of these analysis. And equally, there are packages for school teachers that they can then take back and use these in order to educate the students coming through. So a lot of careful work is done in order to put these together, and currently we're aiming for around a petabyte of data that's available um, for people to, to work with. So as we now look forward, so as mentioned, we're now getting into this point. We've got this problem of what happens when we increase the intensity, uh, the luminosity of the beams. So what we see is that we see if we take a nice simple collision, well, simple, relatively simple, there are here 78 independent sprays that come out. Now, many of these are multiple collisions happening simultaneously inside the detector. And one of the difficulties is to work out what was the actual collision that occurred. And that means that if you're handling multiple overlapping collisions, then you're dealing with a, an exponentially complicated uh, problem. And in particular, we're starting to see 200 uh, collisions as we go on towards uh, run three timescale. So while we can increase the number of collisions, the computing problem gets to be uh, exponentially worse, and equally the data storage problem. <coughs> so we've had to do a lot of careful work around the cost. What is the thing that drives the cost of computing? Um, and with this, we're studying the different combinations of how can we get the infrastructure costs down, but also at the same time, can we optimize the programs in order to make more efficient use of some of the modern CPUs. What are the possible knobs we can turn in order to allow us to be able to get the maximum value out of the taxpayer-funded uh, budget? So where are we at the moment? Um, if we look at the graphs, then we're plotting out. This is based on a positive view of the growth curve. So this is about 20% improvement in storage and compute capacity for a fixed price. The current computing requirements are going to about 60 times in the same window. So this means we're probably a factor of 10 short on where we need to be given the, the fixed budget. Um, now, the bad news is that we've done these models on a 20% base. Increasingly, what we're seeing is that the processor technology and the storage technologies are not following that 20% growth, we're getting lower, around 15% or even lower, simply as some of these things get to the limit of their technologies. The disk changes to heat-assisted, uh, processor changes to smaller and smaller uh, lithography, um, which gets increasingly difficult to do. So this is a worry going forward that we're a factor 10 um, short of where we need to be as we, we look out. And that means that we couldn't do this on our own. So we had to start looking around to see who else is facing this problem. And in particular, how can we collaborate with them in order to understand what can we do to address these curves? Um, there are many science projects out there. Um, one that we've been doing a lot of work with is the Square Kilometer Array. Um, this is an astronomy project. Um, and what's particularly intriguing on the Square Kilometer Array is that they are in this process also <coughs> of culturally growing from small teams into being a multinational structure. So they're just setting up their international organization following similar models to CERN and arranging to have multiple different teams collaborating together, heading towards the same sort of size of collaborations that we see at CERN where we're hitting maybe 3,000 people working on a single experiment. 
The square kilometer array is actually quite an interesting one because at CERN we have the benefit that everything's basically uh, pretty close to where we are, a uh, 20 minute drive. Um, the square kilometer array has an array that's in South Africa. It's in the middle of the Karoo Desert. Um, this creates some interesting problems about how do you get electricity um, there. And also, because of the nature of the uh, work that they're doing, they have to be completely sure there is no magnetic interference. So there has to be no cell phone towers, uh, nothing like that. All this has to be prevented so they can get clean signals from the, the universe. The second array is in uh, Australia, uh, again in the desert. And then these two centers together, producing similar sort of data volumes to CERN, uh, petabytes a second are then feeding this. The difficulty that they have is then you have to transport this data volumes over hundreds of kilometers in order to get to the nearest data center that can actually do the processing. So they've been working with us to do some design work. Uh, we've identified a number of projects and we now collaborate with them uh, on various different activities in order to support this work as well. And they equally uh, contribute towards some of the work that CERN is doing, their, their common problems. So the sort of scale of problems that, that, that we're facing. So um, if we look at the data sets from the LHC, um, we're 200 plus uh, data. And then as we follow out a bit, SKA during its first phase in 2023 will be around 300 petabytes. Um, high luminosity LHC 2026 will be around 600 petabytes a year. Um, and then as this goes on, then SKA get towards an exabyte a year. Um, the reassuring thing in some ways is that when we have discussions with people like Google, um, they're around 15 exabytes at the moment. So what's good there is that some of these large companies, the Facebooks, uh, the YouTubes, uh, are driving this technology. However, they are often in a situation where they have a business model that allows them to make profit and then feed that back into their businesses. Whereas in the academic and research area, you tend to be on a flat budget. So sometimes the solutions will be different. Equally, another set of uh, areas we've been looking at is around medical data. So along with the Hadron therapy, um, we've been working out how, how the, the other problems are being challenged on the uh, biology side. Um, so organizations like uh, EBI in, in Cambridge, the uh, European Biological Institute, they do genomic research and uh, activities such as that. And they already have the problem of personal genome analysis, which is producing significant data. The current estimate on personal health devices, the smart watches, is that this is going to be producing 150 exabytes a year in order to provide and support these smart devices. So that sort of scale of things is so much beyond what we have to cope with, especially because it's very much Internet of Things distributed uh, environment. So it's really not clear how many of these things are going to get solved if they become a bit ubiquitous. So how do we solve the problems? Normally, as we do in uh, physics collaborations, a big problem, you get a set of people who all want to solve it together. Um, and there's a set of organizations now collaborating around how to solve this big data problem. Um, in particular, the telescopes. Um, the, uh, um, down here, there's some neutrino experiments. This one is a experiment that's actually under the sea in the Mediterranean. Um, and it detects these tiny particles called neutrinos that pass through nearly everything. Um, but with a large pool of water, you can actually pick up signals uh, as they go through. Um, the Virgo collaboration that's looking at gravitational waves. Um, and then the physics, uh, so there's CERN and there's the Fair Institute, which is in Darmstadt in, in Germany. So all of us have got together and through a European Union funded activity are now starting to have a look at how do we go about handling data. Um, and in particular, we have common things where we have a data source that's producing data, we need to record it and we need to distribute it for analysis. And on this basis, we're then trying to build up common solutions together so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel for every different science experiment that comes along. <coughs> so this is a, a European Union project called ESCAPE. Um, it just started uh, about six months ago um, and is over a three-year period. But it's not just the, the storage, it's also the software. And 
here's where we're really struggling on Moore's law. Um, so Moore's law has produced us a great growth in total CPU capacity, but the individual cores are still about the same speed as they were a few years ago. We just have a lot more of them. They've also become a lot more sophisticated, so they have complex instructions, but this then requires <coughs> that you do investment in software in order to benefit from all of the, uh, the instructions. The end result is that when we look at just how much we can use of future developments, then we need to do rework of our software. And much of this software is written by physicists, complex physics logic, but they weren't necessarily written in a way that would take the maximum use of the processes. So we need to build up a new set of skills, such as we had years ago when we were programming craze and uh, this kind of thing to build on these, this knowledge. At the same time, another solution that we're exploring is how do we use the commercial cloud resources, the Amazons, the Googles. Um, and with this, we've then been running over the past few years physics workload in the public cloud. Um, part of this has been with the European Union. Um, the benefit there is it stimulates the European cloud market. Um, so having something where we're actually able to use European cloud providers rather than uh, cloud providers that just have data centers in Europe. Um, but also testing out with Googles and Amazons. Um, and with this, we've been able to run a variety of physics workloads in the public cloud. Um, and this is definitely going to be a very interesting development in two scenarios. One is coming up to a conference, for example. The physicists need just a bit of extra computing power that they could then publish papers. And for them, potentially, they could then look to invest in an external public cloud. The other is for smaller universities, it's actually cheaper for them in some situations to be using a public cloud to provide their contribution rather than having an on-premise uh, data center. Another thing that comes along is, is the idea that maybe we can use supercomputers. Um, supercomputers, very special architectures, fast interconnect, uh, and it can be very difficult to adapt the physics programs to work in these environments. Um, and so that means that we do need to do specialized work and maybe only send a subset of the applications to these environments. But we have been successfully using these, and there are some very large machines out there that have been making nice contributions towards CERN. How can you help? Um, so there is an LHC at home program. Um, this allows you to install as part of your screensaver something that when you're not doing anything else um, will take on physics workloads. Um, so it will arrange to, for example, simulate the beam passage around the accelerator so that we can place the magnets correctly. Um, and then with that, you can be contributing towards uh, discovering the nature of the universe. Um, the actual programs themselves, a uh, variety of things, but they don't use the network that much and much data. It's very much compute oriented because the last thing you want is something where you start running this upstairs and downstairs Netflix goes slowly um, and you get the complaints. At the same time, we're looking at a lot of new technologies. Um, so machine learning is of great interest. Um, the difficulty with machine learning in a research environment is we don't have an easy thing to train the programs on. So the traditional model is you show a lot of cat pictures, the machine learning detects what a cat looks like and can identify more cats. Um, if you have a situation where you're looking for a new particle, you don't know what it looks like, so how can the machine learning actually find it? So here it's largely looking for anomalies that can then be the subject of future research after that. Um, FPGAs, dedicated processors, and now, uh, as of the end of last year, we had a quantum computing workshop uh, at CERN, um, and this is looking to be quite an interesting area. It's very, very early days. Um, it was somewhat encouraging because um, quantum computers in their current form need to be cooled down even more than the accelerator needs to be cooled down. So it was good to see someone with actually more of a significant cooling problem than, than we had. Um, other things like DNA storage, um, so there's a lot of work going on at the leading edge, and what we need to do is to find ways under which CERN can hook into that and be used as a test case to validate some of these ideas. So in that framework, then there's a CERN industry collaboration, and then these are the companies that we're currently collaborating with, where we take the extreme computing challenges of the LHC, and we work on those in order to be able to uh, study how the products of tomorrow 
will be applied to the CERN environment, stress test them, validate them, such that then when they become mainstream, they've already passed through the concept that they work at CERN. So where do we go from here? Um, as I say, we look a long way out. Um, the LHC is due to go to 2035, roughly, in terms of its current uh, program. So the plan of the different levels of luminosity of the runs, uh, this kind of thing. <coughs> so we're looking at what will physicists want in 2035 as far as experimental facilities. And there are two current projects that we're looking at around CERN. And there is a meeting in a couple of weeks where physicists from across Europe will get together in order to review some of these and try and start to put together the case for construction. Clearly, building these equipments isn't cheap. Um, we're talking billions and billions. Um, so you don't want to do several of them across the world. Um, and the benefit potentially of doing something at CERN is that you can use that accelerator infrastructure that I'd shown earlier where we can accelerate things up uh, in order to be then using that for the, uh, the experiments. So there are two that we're looking at. Um, the first is a linear collider. Um, so here you fire beams one way and you fire beams the other and you arrange that they, they collide. What's good there is the amount of energy you need is less because you don't have to bend the beam around, which is one of the things that needs a lot of energy in order to do. The other thing that's quite nice is actually you can build a little bit of it to start with and then tack extra bits on in order to get a longer length and therefore more energy, and then you carry on going. And so they have a plan that looks out to that, and that they've done some careful work with the geology to try and avoid running into the lake. Um, and what's nice here is that it's the Jura Mountains, which are uh, very good geographically chalk uh, limestone structures under which we can be building these things um, underground. The next one is a 100-kilometer ring round, so compared to the 27-kilometer ring of the LHC. So we'd use the LHC as a kind of booster startup, and then after that, send it round 100 kilometers of ring. Now, there is the minor problem here that it goes under the lake. Um, now, luckily, the lake in this part isn't <coughs> too deep, so we could still be putting it down. The LHC is 100, me 100 meters underground. Um, but it would mean going under the mountains, um, which, in terms of construction, would appear to be quite a difficult problem. What's been great, though, is since the 1980s, when we built the uh, LEP tunnel that then became the LHC tunnel, building tunnels like this has become a much more common thing. Um, you know, we were quite leading edge in terms of doing it. Now, people are building tunnels using standard boring machines like Crossrail. Um, and with that, they're then able to uh, deliver uh, circular rings like this with great precision. So we're hoping with that 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 will at least help on some of the construction costs. But clearly, a lot of work has to go on to get magnets that are stronger in order to be able to drive the energy frontier to the full. So if you'd like to come and have a look, um, 14th, 15th of September, um, it's CERN Open Day. Um, so with this, there will be a, a chance to sign up, get some tickets, come on site, um, even a chance to go underground and have a look close up to the, uh, the detectors. Places are likely to be under quite a lot of demand. Um, so when we did this last in 2013, we had 80,000 people on site over the weekend. Um, it makes you really appreciate how adventure parks are organized. Um, <laughs> but because arranging things where we had standard conference rooms with only one door, and that meant that people had to come in and leave by the same place that then bumped into the next set of people. You know, these are things that we don't often encounter. Um, so hopefully uh, things will run a little bit easier here. Um, last time with 80,000 people, we got 25,000 people underground over the weekend. Um, so given the environment, uh, it's 100 meters down um, and uh, limited uh, availability, then it was very good to see that it was a chance to show people uh, what they've been contributing towards. So in summary, um, we're hitting challenges on the compute side, on the storage side, on the networking side. Um, and this is part of CERN's job, which is to push the, <coughs> the frontiers. Uh, we do the same thing in magnet technologies and engineering. Um, but what we found is that with these collaborations, like with the Square Kilometer Array, um, with industry, then we're able to then work on these things together. Uh, and that's proved fruitful so far, although clearly to reach the high luminosity LHC 
and the square kilometre array uh, goals for the future is going to be difficult. Thank you.